Hello and welcome. Assalamu alaikum. We are back with yet another show. Today's our webinar is a different kind of thing. There is nothing technical about it. Today we will talk more about personality growth and the conditions of today. COVID is or the job or our industry position is very challenging. How do we handle it? हम सब परेशान होते हैं इंसान को जैसे अल्लाह ने एक सलाहियत दी है कि वो वक्त से जरा आगे का सोच सकता है यही सोच थोड़ा सा हमें नुकसान भी पहुंचाती है परेशान भी करती है कि हम बहुत सी ऐसी चीजों के बारे में सोच के जो अभी नहीं हुई ये शायद आगे जाके हो भी ना अपने आप को हलकान करते रहते हैं अपने ज़हन को उस पोल्यूट कर लेते हैं और फिर उसको मैनेज नहीं कर पाते जो यकीनन हमारी जाति जिंदगियों और प्रोफेशनल जिंदगी उनका दर्शन अंदाज होता है आज के हमारे जो गेस्ट हैं उन्होंने ऑल द वे फ्रॉम द अदर पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका डेनवर से हमें ज्वाइन किया है मिस्टर टेड सिमेंडेंगर और अगली जो हमारी इस शो की लैंग्वेज होगी डेफिनेटली वो इंग्लिश होगी सो अ वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम टू मिस्टर टेड फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस एंड डिलीवरिंग दिस वेबिनार to manage the worry circle i guess this is the this is the best thing that we need to look for and we need to understand for hi ted a very good morning to you how are you man good morning good morning me so thanks thanks for hosting this uh happy to be on the show uh and look forward to a good hour i think i think you hit it right on the head uh uh, since the Great Recession of 2007 slash 2008, uh, nothing has caused so much chaos around the world as what we're dealing with right now. And, and it's very, very important for everybody to understand how your head operates during times like this so that you can not only maintain better balance yourself, but you can help others you care about. And we can be better leaders in our in our uh, families, in our community. You know, first of all, we do our self-justice, but then lead more effectively in our families and our social circles and our corporations and, and also in our community. So I commend all of you guys for attending today to learn this stuff and I'll do the best I can to explain it and answer any questions you might have. Okay. Yes. Thank you, man. Thank you. You wrote a few books on this. I mean, you, you made a lot of research uh, on, on this managing the worry circle. Yeah. Let us know what the worry circle is about. I mean, uh, it's it's something a bit new sort of a thing for us if you could uh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll preface it a little bit now we can probably jump into these various slides that we have but but my interest in this topic came about in the mid 1980s as a result of playing around a round of golf with a good friend of mine who worried about nothing and all he did was complain about his wife who worried about everything and it was causing him a lot of friction. You know, I mean, there was a lot of stress in his relationship over this particular issue. And um, at the end of the day, I started wondering about that. Why do some people worry about very few things? Why other people worry a lot? Because it's a human condition. And I was very interested in it. And so I began research into this topic way back then. And, there, you know, there was no repository online. And so in order to learn what people worried about, I sort of did it the old-fashioned way. I asked them. And I asked over 3,000 people from all over the place. And uh, then you have to put together what you learn and synthesize it and put it into teaching format and everything. And so I have a tremendous passion for this topic, and I love sharing it with people. So I appreciate you guys taking the time out to learn a little bit about how your head operates because today, with all the chaos going on around us, you have to know how to navigate all this stuff between your ears. You know, I'm a big advocate, as you know, uh, we've worked together before, but I'm a big advocate of keeping your head and your heart lined up. You know, when your head and your heart are lined up, when they're like this, life's easy or easier. Uh, but boy, when they go like, start going like this, it gets very difficult and very stressful. And, and the objective today, the end of the calls. I want everybody to understand how to keep this and this lined up, and why we worry about things the way we do. So, so that's that. Then I can jump into the circle if you want to uh, put on a slide or two. Yeah. Can you see the screen, Ted? 
I can, yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so move, yeah, move on to the next, which I think answers your question. Move on to the, there you go. Um, probably. Yeah, I'm not, it's getting cut off. The slide's a little cut off, but I there you go. Okay. And by definition there, everybody can take a look at it. But, you know, what your question was, what is the circle, right? Everybody has a worry circle. It's that little bubble inside your head. And, and inside that bubble, everything you worry about is jammed in there, right? Everybody has a circle, right, worry circle. And it's a very, very interesting thing because it's part of human nature. And what we're going to do now is talk about what goes in there and how those things impact the mind in different ways. Uh, and there are a few rules that go with the circle, uh, and we'll get to those in a second, okay? If we go to the next slide. Yeah, this right here is why worry circle management, being able to manage the noise in your head is so important. Because not only do, does each of us have a worry circle, each of us also goes through life juggling uh, what I call juggling three heads. We have three-headed juggling. And so one head that we juggle is uh, how do we want to appear to others? What's the image we want to put out there? What's the image we want to project? You know, uh, in this, so we're preoccupied with thoughts of that and behaviors tied to that. And then the second head we're juggling is... The feedback we get from others, how, how do we appear to other people? You know, we, we want to project this image, but we're getting this back. Does that create stress for you or not? Yeah. Uh, a, a narcissistic personality disorder, for example, is someone who believes that he or she is truly supreme to others. They're better than others. So the image they want to project is that they are a superior being. They, they are the gifted one. And so the reason that they react so horribly to criticism or, or even constructive con uh, criticism is that there is a violation between the image of superiority they want to project and then what they get pushed back on from other people. You know, they might look at you as arrogant or unknowing or whatever. But the point is those two heads collide and it causes behavioral stress. Now, the third head that we juggle simultaneously, regardless of the image you want to project, regardless how you're received by others, the third head that we're juggling is who you really are. Deep down, who are you really? You know, the heck with the image, the heck with what others say. Who are you? And do you know who that person is? Are you happy with that person? Um and so when we look at the fact that everyone juggles these three heads going through life and everyone places different importance on these three heads at different stages of life, um, there's an opportunity for us to worry about things that are related to each one of these things. Therefore, if we can manage the worry circle quite effectively, you can project the image you want with confidence you really don't care too much, as much about what others think or say because you can't control that. But your power and your strength comes from the third head, who you really are. When you feel good about who you really are and you own it all, you know, warts and all, because we're all imperfect beings. But when you know who you are and you own that, that man or woman, right, all of it, nobody can hurt you. Because they can't do or say anything to you you don't already know. And a lot of times what happens in life is that we, we have all this self-imposed stress in our minds, our worry circles get really crowded with things that deal with image projection or what somebody's saying or whatever like that. And um, that's not necessary. I, uh, I mentioned earlier that we, go, we, we juggle these things with... Uh, uh, greater importance at certain stages of life. Young people, for example, their whole life is tied up in the image they want to project and what other people say to them. Um, who they really are, young person doesn't have a clue. You know, that's part of the journey to adulthood. And this is part of one of my big gripes with social media reliance for the young is that 
it creates so much stress in the life of young people. They don't know how to deal with it, right? When, when they want to project an image to their friends, they're cool, but uh, friends criticize them, especially digitally, where everybody can be an assassin with a keyboard, right? It creates a tremendous burden in the minds of young people. They don't even know the third head exists, so their whole life was those first two. And this is why cyberbullying is so easy to accomplish and so devastating for those who are victimized by it. So this awareness that everybody goes through three, juggling these three heads, and it's really important for you for each of us to know who we really are and recognize that worry circle issues can impact all three of these, right? So, so that's a foundation as we move forward. And the next thing I'd like to do is talk about some of the, some of the rules of worry circle, uh, which would be our next slide. Yeah, I got five principles here. You can, you can, uh, I'll shut up for a minute. You can read them. Okay. So do I need to read them? No, I mean, I, you know, I'm figuring everybody's attending the call reads at a different speed, but they don't need to hear my voice if they're reading the points. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. So the, the first thing is, that, that, hey, worrying about stuff. People have been, you know, humans have been doing that since the days of the caveman and the saber tooth tiger. Right. You come out of that. You come out of your cave and you look. You got a giant cat there, and it's either a, it's either a, a huge house pet or it's something that's going to eat your face, you know? And so you have to learn, learn what, you know, worry's part of it. Um, the second thing is a very important part of worry circle management uh, for each of us to embrace. And that's that these things come and go. What you worry about comes and goes, right? Uh, I mean, Sam, you've got, you've got uh, two lovely daughters, right? And so you might be up to your eyeballs and work issues. If one of them gets hurt on the playground and has to go to the hospital, of what happens to your work issues, right? They get, they, yeah, I mean, they, they, the children, you know, fly right into that worry circle as well. They should. And so worries are portable. Um, and what I put here that, you know, they do, they come and go. You, if your remedy one or something else pops up, that jumps into your circle. But the need to worry is relentless. And number three, the circle must stay full at all times. Right? And so it's like if one goes out, another one has to come in. Yeah, I got, whoa, whoa. <laughs> can't have an empty worry circle, right? It just doesn't, you know, life just doesn't seem to work that way. Now, there's three types of worries, and 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 uh, those three types will fall into eight very predictable categories. We'll go through those in, in the next couple of slides. And I think number five is really important. You're going to worry about stuff. Everybody does, right? I do, you do, everybody on the call does. I mean, we all worry about stuff. What we worry about is a choice. And there's a lot of power in that. The power of positive change uh, lies within that. And we're going to teach today on this call, we're going to teach you uh, two very, very specific techniques where you can immediately learn to maybe be more effective at what you choose to worry about, what you block out your head and how you do that. Right? So exciting opportunity for those who want to learn to manage their worry instead of letting their worry manage them. All right. What do we got next? Okay, so next is this the upbringing. Yeah, I knew what we had. That was just sort of like a phrase that is you know, used, the transition phrase, right? Uh, this is a very important tip, right? Uh, and this is why a lot of times um, what you find is somebody who worries a lot was raised by a worrier. Right? And the reason for that is and this is this is true of ourselves the lives we've led to this point but also in the lives of the children that we are raising right your core beliefs are formed between the years of uh, you know infancy to 13. now very very few kids remember anything before you about three and a half years old maybe four years old that's about when your cognitive retention and reapplication of memories applies but and so you're really looking at about a decade where your core beliefs are formed and your core beliefs come from everywhere. You know, it's your, it's your environment, your family, your religion, your uh, economic uh, status, uh, relatives, teachers, friends, enemies, 
all these different things are, are going into uh, into our heads and they help help shape uh, our map of the world. It's how we see things. And so the second bullet point, warriors beget warriors. What that means is that people that worry a lot and have children will raise them during those formative years to worry a lot because it's their reality the way they know it. And it's all, you know, almost all parents are very, very well attended. They want the best for their children. So they try to teach them, you know, all this stuff. Now, that's a subject unto itself, but just sort of, sort of, sort of uh, you know, sort of assume that's true. And if you were raised by a warrior and you tend to worry a lot, uh, you could probably see that correlation. If you were raised by somebody who didn't worry very much and you don't uh, worry very much, I don't think that's an accident. I think a lot of that is handed down generation to generation. But the second indent point down there is important too. And this is part of the beauty and why I love this topic so much and why I love sharing it so much to people who I can trust will share it to others after I'm, you know, after this call's over. This is, this is something I want you to share with other people. And that is that just because somebody's raised by a warrior or worries a lot today, doesn't mean that he or she has to worry that way forever. This is a very, very changeable life skill. And you can turn this from a, a stressful limitation in your life to a great strength if you choose to do so. And we will cover those uh, uh, tricks later, uh, not tricks, techniques later in the presentation. Final point on the slide. You know, I mentioned that your upbringing, your core beliefs are formed during zero to 13. We are all living uh, in what's called a significant emotional event right now. And so that point here, 13 plus, uh, that refers to age. And so once you've got your core beliefs in place, what changes us over time are significant emotional events. And these are the big things that rock our, our worlds, either in a positive way or a negative way. Like Ms. Ms. Tom Scott is coached there with them right now. And, uh, and uh, there's not, you know, very few things in life that are as brilliant as a child. You know, I think I like to say that that children are the only thing in life that that add a dimension. You know, the rest is just stuff. Now, that's that's my opinion, but I believe that way. There's significant emotional event. So these can be good. They can also be bad. And what the world's living through right now is a classic. You know, the COVID-19 disaster. This is a significant emotional event that will change all our lives. I don't care what corner of the world you're in. You know, I've taught on five continents and 40 some odd countries. And I can pretty much guarantee you it's a significant emotional event in a negative way for everybody. And so then the question becomes, okay, uh, if I recognize this is the case, how do I deal with something that's bigger than me? It's bigger than me. And we'll talk about that. Last point on this slide. Um, if you want to worry less, the, the easiest way to, to, to cut the curve is to stay busy. Uh, idle time is the enemy here. Um, it, the busier you are, the less time you have to worry. I mean, you just don't have the clock velocity time to do it. Let's just focus on it. So that's a little tiny tip, but that's uh, uh, something that, that creates the platform that we're going to move forward from. Okay. Right. And some, and next one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's three types of worries, um, and people ask me sometimes, uh, what type of drink goes best with fingernails? <laughs> and I like lemonade, personally, but um, there's three kinds of worries, right? And these are things you that are beyond your, you cannot control. The COVID-19, I mean, it's a pandemic, right? We can't control that, right? So that's one type of worry that the brain will absorb. Another time, the stuff we can influence, uh, can influence, but can't completely uh, deal with issues. Parenting, to me, is the greatest example of influence worries. We we try to influence our kids the best we can, but anybody who's got a parent, uh, has been a parent to a child who has the ability to go outside on his or her own knows that once he or she leaves, the, <laughs> goes out the door, they're going to do whatever they want to do or whatever the friends can talk them into doing, right? And so those are influence issues. And that's the second type of worry. And then the third, the third kind is the best kind. And these are things in life we can control. 
And our, uh, these are basically self-centered with regards to it deals with our thoughts, the conclusions we draw, and actions we take. Uh, and there's a lot of power in this, okay? A lot of power in this. Uh, so let's just jump, jump through and, and see how the brain processes these three types of worries differently. If we go to the next slide. Okay. okay. Uh, can, can I have a question? Chad? Sure. Uh, sure. Anytime. You said that, I mean, the, the best thing or if you can avoid not to worry if you want not to worry, then you need to kill your idle time. I mean, for a human, it's impossible to be remain busy all the time. Uh, I mean, there must be some idle time with you as well in your life. So how, how do you going to deal with this? You, you need to have some idle time as well for you, at least or for your family or maybe some, some socializing or whatever it may be. But how can be someone keep himself or herself busy all the time to avoid worries? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, and, and I think it's way bigger than just worry circle management. I think it really touches on how you choose to live your life. Uh, and there's a couple decisions that each one of us has to make. And the first one, to me, that overrides, overrides the others is, are you going to live with a sense of urgency or not? Because people that live with urgency tend to work with urgency. Uh, things matter to them, and they get stuff done. Right. They live. They understand. You know, I, uh, in class, you know, I will I will uh, do an example where I actually count down what would be an equivalent number of grains of sand in an hourglass and upturn it and assume that's an average life. Well, the problem with that is it's an average and you never know how much sand is in your hourglass. And so do you uh, do you live with urgency or don't you? Uh, one of my closest friends had a stroke on Tuesday. Uh, he said he's alive. Uh, but he didn't know when he got up on Tuesday morning he was going to have a stroke and find himself waking up in a, you know, in a pretty bad place where he can't he he can speak but he can't collect words he can't find words. This is one of my closest buddies, right? And so that day will come for all of us at some stage or another. Whenever that one grain of sand that that pushes us over the limit um, uh, has that effect on us. And so the first thing I think is you have to decide whether or not you're, you're going to live with urgency. Then I also am a huge advocate for time choice decision making. And there are, to me, every waking uh, minute of every day is broken up into one of four categories. You either, you either spend that time, waste that time, invest that time, or cherish that time. Right, every every activity, every every passing minute has to go in one of those buckets, and so your life really becomes a a, a collection of those individual uh, pie charts, so to speak. There's you know there's only four things: you spend it, waste it, invest it, or cherish it. Right, and so if each day you have some formula of that, uh, you know that leads into the next day that has some determination of how big those four slices of pie are and the next, the next, the next, um, that creates the life you're living, right? And so if you want to have a better life, you got to cherish as much as you can and invest as much as you can in things that matter to you. I don't mean financial investments. I mean, investing in what you guys do as Agile Pakistan, right? You guys, you guys are in the positive change business for people, right? And, and the reason for that is you care. So you have a sense of urgency. You guys get it, right? And you need to evangelize that. But time, choice, decision making. When you embrace that simple concept, that it's important to live with urgency because you'll get more done in the finite amount of time you're going to be on this earth. And you want to, and you consciously make time choices that enable you to invest and cherish as much as you can, spend only what you have to, and waste as little as possible. It becomes how you operate. It's, it's what your brand is. Um, and so what for some people uh, might be perceived as downtime for me is investment time. For example, I walk my dogs two hours a day, one, one early in the day and again around lunchtime. I never take my phone. And it, the whole objective there is for them to enjoy themselves, for me to exercise my big muscles and to think. And so it's investment time for me. 
right? Doesn't look like I'm doing anything, but trust me, I got a whole lot going on for very specific reasons. And so I think I think that self uh, examination of how those minutes are going by in your day um, uh, leads to the answers you need to waste less and do more, right? Uh, and what that means to each individual varies, but that's my approach to it. And why I feel strong about it. Sorry for yes. taking so long to answer the question. No, 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 issue. Thanks for uh, I mean the, describing it in a in a bit detail that. Uh, Clarity was required. Thanks. So, okay. one of nice. the comment or a query that I got uh, while we were speaking is that uh, Mr. Preeta says, "What if my buddy is not having idle time? I mean, he's worried about something that is not uh, making him uh, to to free at any one. I guess this is what I, I understand understood from this query. You got the query? Uh, I'm not." And I'm not clear on the question. Can you rephrase question, that for me? The question is that what if my worry is not having idle time? I mean, the person is so much worried and the type of worry that he's carrying or she's carrying is not giving them the time at all. Okay. They're always busy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think this target slide right here will help us answer that. Okay. Okay. And that's an Great. important question too because this deals with, look, uh, I got a really crowded head, uh, and it, and I know it's not good for me. How do I better manage this? So we're going to talk, talk about this. And then in a couple slides, I'm going to talk about exactly what that head looks like. I even got a picture of what that head looks like, but it's important to understand how the brain processes th these three kinds of worry. I call them evil, confusing, and good things you cannot control are very, very dangerous for you. So when we do have a really crowded head like that, I don't have any downtime. I'm always worried about, you know, it's crowded in there. Things we cannot control are very dangerous to the brain because the way the brain processes those things are in the worst possible extreme that almost never happens. Worst possible extreme that almost never happens, okay? And that's a series of relentless hypotheticals. Uh, I get it a lot now because of the nature of the work I do and all the friends I've collected for so many years, so many places. When some of them is going through a career transition, they they might call me or contact me and they're freaking out because they're saying, you know, I lost my job. Nobody's hiring. I'll never get another job. I'll lose the house. I got the money. I mean, it go on and on and on and on and on. And I say, hold it. Time out. Time out. Time out. Weren't you looking for every job you ever got? Uh-huh. I was. Guess what? <laughs> the next one you get will be that way too, or it will inspire you to become an entrepreneur. Go work for yourself. See a hole in the market. And if you can see it, you can do it. And one of the things you learn about when you're a, a, a smaller proprietor and without all the overhead that's required to run a giant corporation is you can get by. And if you're doing something you love to do or you enjoy doing and money matters, you'll figure out a way to make it. Right. So I'm trying to be, you try to get the emotion of these hypothetical bad things, the negative vortex stopped. But those are real dangerous things for you. And every day in the news, when we see somebody who does something really, really stupid and, I, and I'm in a country, <laughs> I don't have to wait long. It's going to come across the Internet every five minutes. Right. I got somebody doing something stupid right now. A lot of times it's because he or she is snapping. Most of the time it's a he. Uh, it's not because they can't manage the worry circle. Acts of violence, for example. And we'll talk about the cause of that in a minute, too. So can't controls are really, really dangerous for you. If I skip to the bullseye, those are the things we can control in life. These are great for you. This is what you want in your worry circle. And because these are the things that your actions um, and thoughts and deeds right, can, uh, can resolve. You're empowered to do this. If you decide to get fit, you can get fit, right? You just maybe change your diet, exercise a little more, whatever. Eat, eat. Uh, my buddy Chip is always urging me to eat like a rabbit, and I said I'm taller than a rabbit. I need more than that. But, but the point is, we're empowered to do to to engineer change, and if something bugs us enough, we can do it. And so this actually is a great place to be with your worry circle contents. You want stuff in there that you can control. You don't want stuff in there that you cannot. The middle circle here is um, the stuff we can influence. And influence issues are very, uh, to me, they're very matter-of-fact things to deal with. 
Uh, parenting, I said, is a, a good example. Uh, there's some things that as a parent that we can control and some we cannot. We we can control setting a, setting a good example to our children, not just not just telling them, but showing them. But we can't we can't control every move they make. You know, they're kids. They're gonna they're gonna th try things. They're gonna learn, and so you can't carry the stress of the entirety of it around. But you can certainly own the part you can control. And so I always suggest that influence issues are a blend of those two things: the can controls and can't. And so what I would like you to do with these issues is self-examine that and say, and challenge yourself. So what part of this can I control? I'll own it. You know, like snap that half off when I snap, and you own that piece. The rest of it, you can't control. You don't want it. Throw it out. Right. And so when somebody's got a real crowded head, I can pretty much bet with a, a, a great amount of confidence or a large amount of confidence. That if I if I asked you to write down on a sheet of paper in a big circle, or worry, your worry circle, and you, you dump everything you worry about into that circle, you're going to have all three of these types of things in there. And probably somewhere between 45 and 50 percent will be things you cannot control. That's not bad. That's normal. Right. And that's what causes all the angst and the stress, because the, the stress comes from the stuff you can't resolve. You know, you can deal with it. That doesn't cause any stress. It's the other stuff. It's the other noise. So that's a great question. You know, why, you know, what, what's going on in my head that makes it so crowded and stressful all the time? Because I got to, the stuff we can't control and stuff we can influence, that wastes time. It wastes time that creates tremendous negative energy. Right. So if I'm burning a lot of negative thoughts on things I cannot control, I have to go create positive thoughts in my mind simply to get back to a good baseline, to a happy baseline, positive baseline. So there's a certain amount of discipline we have to have as we learn to manage this. But that's why crowded heads can get so stressful, right? It's that we we, we are given access to too many things to, to bring us down. And I got a slide on that in a couple minutes here, okay, that'll build on that, that, it, that will build on that with greater clarity. Okay, next. Yeah. Yep. Okay, there's eight categories. Um, the artwork in the lower right hand corner of the slide, I think, is, is, is a nice one for this because it shows like if a drop of water goes into a still pond, it creates rings that go out from it. And that's the way worry works. The impact area, that's you, that's yourself. And so our worries tend to emanate. They, they, they move out from us. And so the second one you'll see is relationship. Uh, we go to the next page. So we got ourselves and then it's our relationship. Uh, and then familial issues. Our friends. I mentioned my buddy Tim who just had a stroke, right? Uh, job. Work. Okay, what's the next one? Money, money, money. Money. Everybody worries about it. You know, and I've had a bunch, lost a bunch, had a bunch, loved a bunch. And when you don't have it, you think it solves all your problems, it solves all your worries. Then you get it, you find out you got a whole different set of them, and that ain't it. It's all up here. It's all up here. It's what you guys are investing in today. That will uh, that will that will be loyal to you for the rest of your life. Then social and community and the societal. So as we go through these categories, right? We went through the types. Can't control it, right? It can influence it. Can control it. Boom, boom, boom. Then the categories of stuff. Like if I, if you dumped everything onto a page, uh, your worry circle issues. The stuff you wrote down would fall into one of these eight categories. Okay. 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 So in other words, we're all incredibly normal, right? <laughs> and I, yeah. and let, me say, let me say this, because I've been all over the place, and it's part of what I love about my work. They get to meet guys like you, work with guys like you. And what the world will teach you yeah. is that we're about all about 93% the same, and we're about 7% different. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. 
because we can either build on the 93 or we can argue about the seven. And I'm a builder, right? Life skills are relevant to everybody. So just as this stuff is probably resonating to some extent with you guys, it does here and it does in Africa and it does in Australia, New Zealand. It does wherever I go because people are very, very, very similar in, in how we have to deal with these life skills and what, what our challenges are between the years. Okay. All right. What else we got here? So yeah. before we move to the next slide, may I ask a question? I, I just got a query from yep. Ms. Sam Mina. Yep. She asked, that can we experience all the eight categories of worry at one time? Sure. Could you? Yeah. Sure you could. Yeah. And let, let, me, add, let me explain sort of how that can happen <laughs> in a good way and a bad way. This, this piece of art, I call it you know, the open bar effect. And remember, we talked about the crowded head a few minutes ago, right? We had a great question about about, look, man, I got no idle time because my head, it's just bl blowing up in there, right? And so what I call there is, I call that the open bar effect, the open bar effect. And I think you guys, I think the term means the same uh, where you are as, as it does where I am. And an open bar is a big party. Somebody throws a party and, uh, you know, maybe catered food and, and eat and drink as much as you want. You show up. And you hang out for a long time. Somebody else clean, you know, you don't, you don't have to clean up. You don't have to pay anything for being there, right? It's just a party, right? And you get to show up. So you eat somebody else's food and you drink their drinks and you make a mess. You hang out as long as you want. Yeah, then when you get tired or they eventually play the same song over and over to get people to leave, then, then you finally straggle out, right? Now, the problem with having your head be in an open bar is that you're the one paying the price for hosting the party, right? And there's a lot of open bar heads right now because of, you know, I, hate, I hate to admit it, because we're, we're using technology, but there are more portals into the mind than ever before. There are more access points into your head than ever before. There's more, uh, there are more hours and opportunities for stuff to get into your head than ever before. And so if your head's sort of like a magnet that collects everything that comes to it, you're going to end up with an open bar, right? Because everything that has access to it is in there. And, man, it can get crowded, and it can get messy, and it can get tired. And at the end, guess who has to pay for all of that? You do. You do. So it's not – wrong to recognize that we might have a little bit of an open bar right now, but we don't have to. There's a there's a better way. There's a better way. Okay, let's take a look at a better way, Ms. Sam, if you could if you could move the okay. next slide. This one? Yeah. I want you to treat your head like a castle. And a castle has a drawbridge over a moat, right? And it's invitation only. And so when when all of that noise, those people clamoring to come into your house and eat for free and trash your house, your head, and all that kind of stuff, hang out because they want to, blah, 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 blah. Uh-uh, 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 it doesn't work that way. Castle has a drawbridge. The drawbridge goes down. So what we've learned already, if it's a worry circle issue we cannot control, we don't want that in the castle anyway. So we'll sweep that out of, that's out of, over the drawbridge, and then we raise that back up. Instead of having open bar access, we're leaving the drawbridge now where every stress, every 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 people, person, or thing that, that, that wants to bug us has free run of the castle. No, 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 no. Invitation only. We will, we will say, can I control this, yes or no? The answer is yes. We're going to lower that drawbridge. We'll welcome that issue in. We raise the drawbridge again. So we have discipline now around what's in our head. Um, and this, this helps us only have the, the correct things in our worry circles. We don't have a lot of stuff rattling around in there that, that serves no positive gain and uh, comes at a price for you, either emotionally or from an energy standpoint or whatever like that. And then I put down in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, you know, access does not mean entitlement. Just because somebody has access to your head does not mean that he, she, or it has the right to be there. Uh, there are seven vital words that I will share with you uh, uh, 
from here to the balance of the of the presentation today, but access to, to your head does not mean that he, she, or it has the right to be there. Okay. All right. Now, how you protect the place, right? First thing you commit to it. Work circle management is 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 is, is it, it's an emotional commitment you make to yourself that you're going to turn this into a strength of yours. Uh, and so the first thing you have to do is, is commit to it. Uh, and I would say I've taught this all around the world. I've had some, some extraordinarily transformative stories that have warmed my heart, you know, after people were like before and after kind of scenarios, you know, it's amazing. Um, because you can channel your energy a lot better once you, once you learn to protect the worry circle. Uh, number two is one of your uh, two options, I think, to protect this in, in an easy to understand way is that what we talked earlier that uncontrollable issues, you know, that theoretical, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, then this will happen. This will, you know, the pandemic's going to happen. I'll probably get it and then I'll give it to my family and I'll get it. You know, I'll die. Well, it, I mean, my, for Pete's sake. Um, I recommend that you put uh, un worrying about things you cannot control, your behaviors can't resolve. You put them on a mental list of things you don't do. We all we all have things in life that we don't do. We have personal brands. There's just stuff we don't do, right? Um, and so we all have that mental list. Now, we know that it is toxic to think about uncontrollable worries because they're emotionally debilitating and draining. But we don't want to do it, so just put it on your list of things you don't do. Um it's it's not you know we don't do heroin we don't rob banks you know we're not mean to, to children or poison you know uh, zoo animals I mean there's stuff we don't do right and so you just put it on there and if you catch your your mind starting to worry about something you can't control and eh, you stop yourself there's something I don't do that right because that's we're talking about head safety here we're, we're talking about your balance between the ears. Now, the other way you can do it is in this uh, it, it, it is uh, very helpful for those who worry a lot now, but don't want to don't want to worry about the wrong things in the future. And I think if we all look back at certain stages or, or, or episodes of our life, we probably all have things that we used to do that we don't do anymore. Um, yeah, I grew up I grew up smoking cigarettes, right? Uh, and then one day, uh, woke up with a bad cough, and I thought, "Man, this is stupid. You know, this is this is there's not a future here." So I stopped. Never use the word quit. Stopped with a half a pack on my dresser because I just decided, you know, I used to do that, but I don't do it anymore. And we've all got little things in our life that, you know, perhaps from lessons learned, you know, from something that didn't go right or whatever. Uh, might have been self-centered in a previous relationship and we learned in a subsequent relationship that's more important to give than take in a relationship. You know, there's there's things that, that we evolve from and to. And so I don't think it's ever good to beat yourself up because we might have worried about a lot of stuff. What we do is to say, you know, I, I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. And that's okay. That's okay. All right. So those little tricks, you can use them right now. It's just a state of mind and how you're going to approach head management. And then, of course, the next slide sort of nets this part up. Happy's good. When you have a good, clean worry circle and everything in it, stuff you can control, you're in a pretty level-headed place. I mean, you don't have all the emotional amplitude of some people. I'm sure we've all worked with these folks. You sort of have to peek your head around a corner to see whether it's the the good one or the evil one is there that day because they have all these those emotional amplitude in, in things, right? I don't, we don't want that. We want a nice, even keel, and then uh, it frees us up to be happy or positive. Now, I do, I will point out, not everybody in the world needs to be happy or wants to be happy. A better word is probably content. Contentment is good. So whatever form peace of mind takes for you is great. But part of the key to that will be managing the circle. All right. Okay. Now, yeah. Misa, let me do a time check. We're about forty-five minutes into this. Yeah. Uh, do we have a do we have a finite stop? Or are we free to go uh, for a little yeah. bit longer than an hour, or what? 
we are, yeah, we are carry on. Please, we can, we can continue. We can. Okay. Okay. All right. So now, what I want to talk about. So that's the fundamentals of the worry circle, right? It's how the brain processes the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, and or the confusing, and and uh, the good, the bad, and the confusing, right? Um, and uh, what I want to do now is I want to shift. We're going to build on this, this foundational knowledge that you guys have gained. And I'm going to talk about the impact of technology on behavior and happiness. Okay. So we'll, we got the we got the, the baseline now. We're going to put a house on that structure, right? As it relates to technology. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into the, uh, the next. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, I wrote about this one too after the worry circle. I wrote about this after I spoke at MIT, you know, the uh, the genius think tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I got involved to speak to their graduate school. And some of the projects these computer geniuses are working on are off the charts. I mean, I, I, they, they had to dumb it down to explain to me what they were doing. That's how incredible the stuff was. I got invited in to speak to the, pe the students because they'd had 11 suicides on campus. And the administration wasn't that worried about it because the administration says, ah, Harvard's had 20. And a friend of mine was, was running a graduate school at that time, and he had been a worry circle advocate. He had been a student, you know, that had sat through a, a learning lecture on it, and it helped transform his life. So he called me up, asked me to come in and talk to these, these genius kids about about what the heck is going on with them. And so from that, he is a, by design, he he designs um, uh, computer-driven systems for the betterment of society. Fabulous work that he's doing. Dr. Agnes Steve is his name. Um, and uh, his whole goal is to use technology for the betterment of man. And I know a lot about people. So we collaborated. And from that speech, I just I had so much interest. Uh, I had three times the normal size audience that they have for guest speakers at MIT, which told me that I was on a vein. I had something important here. And so I ended up, I thought I could knock this book out in a thousand hours. It took me, well, I don't know, 1600. You know, it just, it was fascinating. The deeper I got in it, the more there was to learn. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Let's go to the... Uh, Go to the next one. Here you go. This is sort of true. I'll put it in for levity. All right. Yeah, I just saw a note about, you know, it'd be better for be interactive instead of me just preaching at you. Um, this is a scrum. It's an open forum. You can jump in whenever you want, right? Uh, uh, so don't don't worry about me steamrolling, right? If, if you got a question, jump in. Um, uh, it is not unusual to have this frustration or limitation when we have a group, because there's three types of preferred learning styles, and that question deals with one of the three, and this presentation deals with a different one of the three. Adults learn. Adults learn, um, you know, by either uh, visual means, by reading, by an audio means, by listening, or by kinesthetic uh, means, which, which is interactive, and by doing. And so when it's, uh, it becomes less effective to somebody who wants to do something, um, that unfortunately is a limitation of the process and the time. And I recognize that. Uh, that's sort of the where we're stuck with this and why that might be frustrating. So I would just ask you, don't wait, jump in, jump in. If something's on your mind, jump in. Okay. Question uh, about yeah, do we yeah. live in the present, you know, as opposed to the past? Oh, heck yes, absolutely. It's all about mindfulness, your power. Look, you guys are, are change agents, right? You, you know, what you're doing is it's, it's way bigger. I, I think as an outsider looking at what you're doing, I think it's way bigger than you know what it is. Yeah, yeah, I don't think, you know, you know, it's important. I think it's even bigger than that because one of the things technology will do is it strips away our mindfulness. The answers, the information, it's in the box, not in your heads. What I'm trying to do is, is put it back in your heads because people are herd animals. People are, people are like sheep 
And, you know, you give me a big flock of sheep or goats out in a pasture, right? Five of them will determine the direction of all the rest. Five goats, five sheep. If they decide to go one way, the herd just follows. You guys, with what you're doing, uh, and, and, you know, uh, what you're evangelizing is so vital nowadays, right? You're the lead sheep. So you have to have uh, a conscious awareness, mindfulness. And this is one of the, the big problems that we have right now with so much digital reliance is the end. The information's in the box. It's not in the mind. Your power will come from being in the mind. If, 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 if it's all in the box, what do I need you for? I just get somebody else to run a box, right? You want to you wanna collect wisdom, and that's what this is all about. This is about mindfulness, which deals with areas like critical thinking, emotional management, uh, worry circle management, you know, on and on and on. But it's... It is that it's that in the moment effect and this uh, consciousness of how your time is, is uh, going by. Ted, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should take this one. Uh, Mr. Suhail Ahmed has asked, I guess you can see on the screen as well, but let me read out for you as well. Why accomplished people like Einstein are suffered by worry or unhappiness leading to depression while having very low aggregate of eight type of worries you mentioned oh i don't i don't know that i buy that statement as 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 a truth um i i think there is a curse that comes with genius personally and part of the reason is that people are herd animals and when you are a unicorn uh, it's tough for you to find anybody that really understands the width and the depth, the horizontal nature and the depth of, of what you're dealing with. Um, I don't know that he would have a low aggregate of eight types of worries. I think if he, if, if he was, if he was a tortured soul, he was worrying about stuff. Maybe, it, maybe that he, I don't know. I mean, maybe that he could not live long enough to resolve all the things he wanted to do. Maybe that he could not control the fact you can't control the behavior of others, that some some rejected him as being a nut. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I, I would very push back very strongly on that they had a low aggregate of the eight types of worries. And the reason for that is I've worked with a lot of geniuses and their heads are as crowded or worse than anybody I know. Everybody's got issues. Yeah. So let's move on to the next slide, right? Yeah, yeah unless you want to take this. Uh... Yeah, there is a comment, I guess, yeah. uh, if yeah. we can uh, read it out. That the happiness index of teams, Mr. Soil Service is. Happiness index of teams and managers is directly contributor to the workspace performance we all witness. Any checklist to make sure if people at work are stay happy companies should have a chief happiness officer it's a great idea like uae has ministry of happiness yep uh, this is a corporate culture issue and it tends to come down from the top um some companies look at employees as expenses other ones look at them like investments um I mean, this will vary radically. If any of you guys have worked for more than one one company, I mean, you know this, right? I mean, the, the cultures are different. Um, I've always been a big advocate of, of developing people because I got into this business because of a disgruntled employee who went into a team meeting and shot and killed seven of nine coworkers. He liked one of them, passed the gun over him. The ninth one he missed, and the guy's running down the hall. Took a shot at him, put a bullet hole in the wall. And so I have seen what happens when humans crumble because of their inability in the workplace to manage stress. And it caused me to walk away from my corporate career and to get it get into a, a pursuit that means more to me like this. So I am very people-centric. I need each one of you on this call to be very people-centric. There's a lot of hurt people walking around out there. Right. And it's really important for you guys as the lead sheep that's going to determine the direction of these flocks. Uh, you can't let people get, get 
uh, too taken down by what's going on around them in their worlds. But uh, that issue right there just uh, deals with corporate cultures. I fit some places and some places I don't. You know, people that want to invest in their folks, so they, they hire me. People that look at their folks as just numbers, they don't hire me. That's great. This slide is really important. Uh, these are three of the seven words I need you to, if you get nothing else out of today but seven words, uh, these are three of the seven, and that's think, feel, do. Think, feel, do is the principle of all human behavior. What you think drives how you feel. It's how you feel that drives what you do. Okay. Um, technology cannot obsolete this, nor will it ever obsolete this. Therefore, if you ever want to understand how to motivate somebody or try to figure out why somebody did something, this is true in business or parenting. Remember these three words, what you think, dry, say, feel, how you feel, dry, what you do, think, feel, do. And so I just put an example in here, a well-managed worry circle versus a, versus an open bar. I mean, thoughts, which one's going to be in a better position to, you know, make prudent decisions, to take better actions? Obviously, what's the worry circle in? Uh, feeling, emotional conclusions, thoughts percolate and then lead to emotional conclusions that are either good or bad, you know, it's, this is the carrot of the stick, pursuit of a positive reward or the avoidance of a negative consequence. And so, but what happens is humans act upon, they take action, they do things based upon those emotional conclusions, right? So if somebody wants to go on a weight loss program, he or she does it because they got to the feeling where they, they didn't, you know, they get tired of, of uh, being uh, less fit than they could be. And so they act upon it. Uh, I'm in an unusual position right now in my country because I've got a bunch of great people, millions of great people protesting all over the place because of terrible human crimes, tragedies uh, that were inflicted upon innocent people, right? And so what are the people doing? Well, they're protesting. Why? Because they're tired of it. They want to avoid a negative consequence. They want this stuff to stop. And, and you can count me among them. I'm right there with them, right? And so what we think drives how we feel, how we feel drives what we do, okay? Fundamental principle. These are the three of the seven words I need you to, to embrace today, okay? Okay. Yep. So we move on to the next slide, or we have another query, if you could answer that. Uh, it's from Mr. Azhar Hussain. Uh, he's asking, what's your advice for the people losing their livelihood or jobs due to the COVID-19 effect and considering the magnitude of uncertainty, finding themselves in a abyss of worries and anxiety? You know, it's a great question and it's a question that's rattling through the minds of, you know, millions and millions of people. Wonderful people, great people, uh, skilled people. Um, uh, this this has a few a few pieces to it, but I think they're they're very important. One of them is that this is an uncontrollable losing the work losing your work is an uncontrollable worry circle issue, where right? it's caused by COVID, right? And so therefore, dwelling you know feeling sorry for ourselves or dwelling on it enough, we that really doesn't do us any do, do us any good. I'm gonna I then talk to what what I recommend with regards to success predictability and success predictability is how likely you are to, to uh, land on your feet or create an opportunity or to do really, really well at something. Uh, I have found in my work, which deals with developing talent for a living, that success predictability is not too hard to figure out. Um, each one of you guys on this call, has a has a knowledge set and a skill set and a certain attribute set, not attitude. You know, attitude is a temporary state of state of mind. Attributes are is who you are. You know, uh, do you panic or do you step back and assess what can I control, what don't I control, all this stuff. But every opportunity in a marketplace, in order to do that job well. Like in our you know next next job right, it's going to require a certain amount of knowledge, a certain amount of skills, 
and certain and in a specific set of attitudes. When you find that and the knowledge, skills, and attributes of the individual align with the knowledge, skills, and attributes that's required of the work, you get sustained high performance. I think one of the big mistakes that I've seen over here anyway when people have been displaced is they start running sideways 100 miles an hour and they start visualizing themselves in every conceivable job opportunity that might be out there when in fact their knowledge, skills, and attributes are not a good fit. And there's other out, other people out there with far far better things. So one of the one of the things I think we owe ourselves in these scenarios is to really self-assess and say, okay, this is a significant emotional event. You know, my career got waxed for no particular reason of my own. But what do I know a lot about? What skill set do I have? And what intangibles can I bring? Because that's your personal value proposition. And when you're and then you either work your personal network to try to find somebody where you know you'll be a good fit and a culture fit, or you create your own opportunity. You see things that people do not see. I gave a speech on Tuesday in Bahrain or to Bahrain. And one of the things I told them is what well, COVID-19 is going to do to us in the marketplace and um, uh The worldwide, you know, the worldwide economy is, is they said it's going to flash forward. We're going to we're going to skip an entire generation of slow evolution. And so now the magic now, in my opinion, is you have to be able to look at the new reality from a strategic standpoint and say, what will this new reality give me under the new rules of the game? What's going to change? What will be different? And from that, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And what's going to be absent is the fact that we haven't had a, a gradual evolution toward these changes. I mean, this is a this is the biggest quantum global step I've seen in my lifetime in my career. And so the opportunities will be there, but I think you might need to self-create them. But there's one thing I want you to never ever do, and that is to doubt yourself. Don't let any of your friends doubt themselves. What made them successful before? will make them successful again, but you got to have your knowledge, skills, and attribute, your value proposition. You got to know what that is and then pursue things where you can be uh, really, really good once you're given an opportunity. Right? And that goes back to that third head, your self-awareness. Right? I'm really good at some things and I am dreadful at de things like details. Awful. I'm the world's worst. If I tried to post for a detailed job and somebody hired me because I had this big pedigree or whatever, I would I would fall flat on my face because I don't have the KSAs to do the work that's required. Right. So there is a magic inside of each one of you, but panicking won't help and doubting yourself will never help. We step back and we methodically think, where is the world going? Where's the business world going? I think Pakistan, when I was working over there, was a very interesting market to me because it had such a big future in so many directions. If you guys would, would get out of your own way and, uh, with regards to um, uh, the, the strategic vision aspect of things. You know, I thought there was a lot of execution on what you were supposed to do. But your opportunity now is a quantum leap in innovation and creativity. And Lord knows everybody's starving for that. And there will be there will be tremendous success stories that come out of these hard times. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So let's move to the next slide. And after that, uh, yeah. we'll take... thanks for that question, by the way. Um, that's yeah, a, thank you, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide. Yep. This one. These are some of the, you know, when I talk about the impact of technology on behaviors, you know, and we talked about time choice decision making in the past, your waking hours, you either spend it, waste it, invest it, or cherish it. But because of technology and a reliance on it, uh, there's more stuff we do more of than we used to, right? Like the more, you know, and now, uh, has 5G come over to you guys yet or not? 5G? No, 5G, 5G is, is not yet, right? But you, we do have 4G. Yeah. Well, five's coming, right? And so this will just get amplified even more 
because it's just faster and it lets you do more. Now, it'll also accelerate robotics, which is going to be a huge global problem for so many, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of blue collar workers. But, but anyway, the point is we do more things because of our expanded technology reliance. Uh, you guys can read this, or me, Sam, you can read it. Or the, read it the, yourselves. Okay. There are two pages. That I think. Uh, this is the first one, uh, which starts with the global engagement and ending on seven point. Seventh point is traffic delays. Do you want me to write read all seven points on this slide? Yeah, I mean, you know, I just I wanted to give everybody the opportunity to read them and just think about them real quick. Okay, so the first okay. is the global engagement, digital addiction, addiction denials and justifications, stress and fatigue, texting, dopamine, craving, helicopter, parenting, snap judgments, traffic delays, reckless driving, and road range. Road okay. range. Yeah, real quick, I'll just fill in uh, some of the mortar around a few of these bricks here. Digital addiction growing like crazy. Uh, it's the biggest addiction problem I've ever had to deal with as a behaviorist. Yeah, uh, the, it, is, it is a great, you know, great justifier for those with a problem, you know. And what's interesting, drug addicts want to quit doing drugs, alcoholics want to quit drinking, people with digital addiction problems have no interest in quitting. They just want to learn how to manage it better, right? And that's a big thing, right? And, and so, uh, stress and fatigue, I think some of that comes because you can't, nobody feels they can unplug or the FOMO thing and all that kind of stuff. Texting's a allure. Is because it releases dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is like the body's natural cocaine. And so when we get a text message, our brain says, oh, I'm important, I'm on it. And then the, the size of the jolts dependent upon the source of the text. If it's somebody you really admire, really important, uh, the dopamine jolt is, is uh, greater. And because of that, uh, texting helps feed digital addiction. Helicopter parenting is when people get in the way of letting their kids make their own decisions. The biggest problem in universities right now, uh, all over the world, and, and it's not just a U.S. thing or a Pakistan, all over the world, is that kids are entering college, university, lacking in coping and resilience skills. Uh, and so they don't know how to deal with, with problem solving, accountability for the choices they make and all that stuff. The parents have, have hovered too much. They you know, shield them from too much. And I think we've all seen the snap judgments, uh, traffic. You guys don't have road rage issues over in Pakistan. I'm so jealous. Uh, that is caused by a perception of the brain's perception of a violation of our space envelope. This is we all have a space envelope around us when we interact, you know, with among each other. We have a visible one around the car. And when somebody violates that, it's we take it as a threat. Right? We have an emotional, negative emotional reaction. So we, we react to that, think, feel, do, right? So that's what causes that. Not a big issue for you guys, and I'm glad. I hope it never is. Next page. So All right. The telepressure, password insanity, oversubscription, complication of things that require no complication. Okay, example is... Pumping gas, the skyrocketing advertisements. Uh, this is related to what you were mentioning, 5G thing. Um, yep. Busy, the velocity of life, and speed increase of three-headed juggling. Yep. Yeah, we talked about three-headed juggling earlier, right? And so I, I hope these look familiar to you. I don't usually get a lot of push on, on these things. You know, the, yep. the gas pump is my one of my pet peeves, because over here, a lot of times you have to do it yourself, and then the machine asks you six questions before, you know, all you want to do is buy gas, man. I just want to get petrol. I don't need a car wash. I don't have a happy number. I don't have this. I don't need a coffee. I mean, it's a da, 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 da. and then uh, passwords are going nuts these days. Uh, advertisements. When I was a kid growing up, you would be ex expected to see about 1 million advertisements in your life, which sounds a whole, like a whole lot. Today, because the, there is no, uh, there are no boundaries around advertisements, most of us will see somewhere between a million and a million two per year. You'll see a hundred million in your lifetime if you live, you know, live a long time. But the point is uh, astronomical, and, and advertisements are designed to get you to take action by telling you you're either better off for something or you can avoid something bad happening. 
And so remember we talked about the open bar, about all this stuff coming at you, right? Some of it's obvious and some of it's more subtle. And the advertisements really help uh, put the, put trash in the open bar environment. So when we talk about like what's technology done, technology's got a lot of great things for us, but it, but it, it comes at a little bit of a behavioral trade-off. And I have, and as long as I've been in the people development business, I've never seen anything remotely close to technology as regards to, to changing uh, behaviors in individuals. Okay, let's go on to the next one then. Okay, so. So the next slide is uh, portals into the mind, do-it-yourself society, frustration and impatience, cyber criminals, cyber bullies, and other various no good, good nicks. Okay, no gotcha. Good. Political correctness. Okay, instant notoriety. Okay, good and bad, and political. Uh, what do you? How do you spell? Successfully. Okay. Stuff. You are taking my exam, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, talk about this, and we have another query. I guess this is uh, more uh, related to the, the subcontinent or the uh, the part of the world that yeah, we are living yeah. in. But I guess first you talk about, you want to talk about this slide, or this is an important query from Mr. Kambarali. Uh, no, I think it's a very, very important, uh, very yeah. important query, right? I, so have no magic, I have no magic answers, right? Yeah. But I do have some life observations. And one of them is that sometimes not everything in life uh, rolls out in a straight line. Uh, and I think this is one of those situations. Uh, there, there's no precedent for what we're going through right now. Um, and you guys being in a, in a third world country, have a different set of issues that are more challenging than my country, for example, in some regards. But there's actually one or two things that I think are better for you guys than our guys. Uh, in America, we live in a consumer-driven society that the culture relies on accumulation of things. You guys have a more spiritual existence. You guys know that things aren't always the answer. You have more spiritual strengths. And money over here is really easy to borrow. And when the economy was in a run-up, People would just borrow it because they figured they could always make it and pay it back. Well, now what you've got is you've got millions and millions and millions of people over here. I think we got 43 million that have lost work. And they're all overextended. 40% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They've never saved anything because debt is so easy to accumulate. So their worry circle issues deal with being buried because they were overextended and short-sighted. You guys have an, a sustenance issue more than that. But I think both create a similar kind of stress. And I think that from, with regards to this valuable question, this vital question, first thing you can't do is you can't panic, right? You have to take a look at, at what you've got and uh, what the market might give you and what you guys can do together. I don't, this is not an isolation problem. But I do think this might be a perfect time to introduce the other four words that I want you to remember today. Uh, and I've got them. You know, I've got them on a slide later, but I don't know if you can read this. Is that read or is it reversed? Is it, is it reversed? There you go. See these four words? These four words? Beginning, middle, and gratitude. Beginning is a lowercase, or for the most part, low, smallest, smallest uh, font size. Middle's real big. And is smaller and bold 
They all have periods after them. And then the word gratitude is beneath them. These are the other four words I want you to never forget. Everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A life does, a career does, a job does, uh, a story does, a movie does, a book does. Now, what happened with this COVID-19 thing, in the beginning, we none of us saw it coming. The art that I showed you there, the reason I have that, that's taped on my computer, by the way. I, I never <clears throat> go without looking at it. Because I want a constant reminder. We're in the middle. And the middle there was in real big letters. We're in the middle. And the middle is when all the chaos happens. We will get to the end. There will be an end. And the end was in smaller smaller font size, but it but it was bold, bold type. And there's a period after. In each one of these stages, there will be a period after. Beginning, is then, you know, that's over. We're in the middle now. So all of our jobs is to get through the middle, get to the end. Underlying all that, I had the word gratitude. And I think gratitude is something that we never lose sight of. You guys wouldn't be on this cause if you weren't leaders in your families, in your communities, in your companies. You're winning. You're winning. Right, you're winning, and I, you, you know, third world, third world country, or, or or not, you know what I'm talking about. You go ten minutes outside your town in the village, you will find people you'd never trade places with. So you don't want to panic, you don't want to lose sight of anything, you don't want to lose perspective. We're in the middle of this. I do think it's going to be a connectors network and an innovators network with regards to jobs. Just because somebody's not doing it now doesn't mean you can't invent it. And I think great ideas and great successes are going to come from that. But you have to be able to see something. You got to be able to fill a need. Um, tough times, but I think there are times that call for, for togetherness, uh, and not isolation. And if something's bugging you, if your worry circle gets real crowded and you're feeling a lot of stress, reach out. And if you don't have somebody local to reach out to, you know, contact me. I'll talk to you. We'll get it done. Right? So I don't have a magic answer. I just got an approach that might work for you. Okay. Thank right. you, man. So a quick yeah. time check. We have we have uh, 15 minutes left. We can yeah. we can go on, but I mean the time slot for the sessions remains uh, for 90 minutes, and after that, most of the people start losing. I mean the the, yeah, the yeah. interest. Well, I appreciate, of, I appreciate uh, yeah. your patience because I haven't really answered anything short. <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, you have okay so yeah let me gun through the rest of this real quick and leave us a couple minutes for questions so you know we the point is that you've got all this stuff going on behaviorally that we're doing more and more of and if we're doing more of some stuff we have to be doing less of others right i mean it's time choice decision making if you make one slice of that the the you know waste invest cherish spend right you make one slice bigger and thus must must get smaller because there's only four pieces there so there's a whole lot of this stuff going on. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> this deals with time choices. Uh, and we covered this earlier. Don't need to dwell on it. Um, I think cognizance on the, how your time goes by each day, ownership of that, living with urgency and investing and spending as much as you can in things that matter. Investing is investing in things that matter to you. Uh, investing right now, in a, in a third world uh, country where you might be up against it from a job perspective. Investing in you right now is figuring out your next move. Not panicking, but figuring out what's the next strategic move that I want to take so that my knowledge, skills, and attributes in the marketplace can either create wealth for somebody else or create wealth for me. And if you've got three or four buddies in the same predicament and they have all different areas of expertise, maybe you guys are staring at a company and don't even know it. Right. So uh, that's a time choice decision making. Next. Okay. Right. You sort of have to read this one on your own because I had the artists use all sorts of different type styles here. Um, but like I said, we're doing more of some things. And then what are we doing less of? So take a moment and look through these.
Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I'm just going to move on to the next then. What I did there is identify these behaviors that we sort of traded. You know, we're doing more of some of this noise and then we're doing less of others. And then I took a look at all the things that we don't do as much of anymore. And I, and I put them under, against Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the pursuit of happiness. It's five steps. Uh, level one being you know, the physiology. And this is existence. So you know you're going to survive. And then we go to comfort, and from there, once we've attained comfort in, in life, then we look for love and affection, and then we look for respect. And then once we have respect, we seek self-actualization. You know, Einstein's name was mentioned earlier. He was a very self-actualized guy with regards to he did what he was born to do. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of noise on his staircase as he got there, Right. All of the social unrest in America right now is dealing with level four. People do not feel respected, and they and they are reacting to it. This is the same thing that fuels gang violence, because gangs take the place of families, which is level three. They don't uh, people from, from tough environments zero to thirteen significant emotional events afterwards. They don't have love and affection, so the gang fills the gap. So. It's really important for us to manage behavioral choices in a way that helps protect your march toward the toward where you want to go here. Um, and I think that uh, is why that when we take a look at all the good things technology does for it, recognize that it's not a panacea, and some things do create different challenges. And self awareness. Um, uh, is paramount, especially these days. You, you've got to keep control of what's going on in your head. It all starts there. Okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to a- uh, answer Hassan's uh, question, too, uh, after we just talk. This is my suggestion for COVID times. Uh, eat healthy. Exercise the brain. Exercise your big muscles. Um you got to get rest. Uh, I like a lot of rest. I try to get a minimum of eight, but preferably nine hours a night in order to do that. I structure it. You're going to have trouble falling asleep sometimes. What I want you to do, as soon as you, you feel yourself tossing and turning, I want you to start thinking nothing but the seventh word, gratitude. Start thinking gratitude thoughts. All the, all the wonderful things that have happened in your life the friends and family around you, the things you've learned. I mean, there's a million of them. When you fall off, you'll you'll drift off of sleep quite well, and you actually work up a better frame of mind. So gratitude thoughts is your secret weapon to get better sleep. Uh, Stay busy, connected, and blah, blah, blah. And then avoid the reflexive loop. Reflexive loop is where you do the same stuff over and over and over and over. Right? Get up same time, eat same food. Um. I don't think that's good. I think you want to, to have variance in your um, experiences and your time choices. Just keeps the mind a little fresher. Okay. And then uh, Hassan's question, how to deal with personal worries, professional worries, pressure as well. Well, again, you know, we talked about what are the, what are the eight categories we're going to have, right? We have two of them. And so I think the approach is the same. Hassan, it's always your personal worries is can you control it, yes or no? If you can control it, you own it. If you can't control it, you sweep it out of the castle. Same thing with on the professional side. Um, I do think a lot of times, especially caring employees, put too much pressure on themselves that is not totally controllable. Uh, sometimes that comes from pressures that we put upon ourselves because of the image we want to project to our bosses and our peers. And we're hypersensitive to the feedback of others. Uh, that's why uh, performance appraisals, for example, are so uh, emotionally taxing to give and they're horrible to receive. It's because one of the human nature factors with regards to, to judgments is that we judge ourselves by our intentions, others judge us by our actions. And during a performance appraisal, those two things sometimes collide, right? We intend one thing, we're hearing it from something else. 
but you can't carry that burden around. It's, did you do the best you could? Was it the best decision at the time? So I think your, your approach is identical. Use worry circle management principles to apply to both of those things and protect your castle. On what you can control, if it's an influence issue, as work often is, what part of that can you control? Snap that off and own it. What part can't you control? Sweep it out of the castle, get it out of there. And try to keep that circle occupied with both your personal things and your professional things that within your means to control. That's the best way to stay stable and not panic during tough times. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, I got to wrap this up and get my motor. I apologize for running at the mouth so much, guys. You find in life what you look for. If you look for the good, you see the good. If you look for the bad, you see the bad. Uh, don't dwell on the bad here. There will be opportunities. This will end, the sixth word. And if you've uh, not lost sight of gratitude along the way, you'll, you'll be okay. You'll get through this. As I mentioned earlier, if you struggle, if your head gets too crowded, contact me prior, privately. Okay? Okay. Okay. So we are coming to the next slide. Yeah, that was almost a big finish. This should be it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So think, feel, do. And then beginning, middle, end, and gratitude. Remember those seven? You solve a lot of problems right there. Okay? Okay. 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 So this brings us to the end of this wonderful session, a wonderful talk. Thanks a lot, Ted, for joining us in a very early morning. I mean, in this part of the world, you are at the right, I mean, at the corner of the world. We are at the other corner of the world. So it's uh, 12 hours difference, if I'm not wrong, or maybe 11 hours. It's 8.30 p.m. in the night. And you have, I guess, 7.30 a.m., right? Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank all you guys uh, for what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. And me, son, thanks for having me and everything. Uh, you guys are integral in your communities and the lives of others. Uh, so keep serving others. Stay positive. Believe in yourself and everything will be okay. And I am uh, I'm humbled by your willingness to stick with me for 90 minutes. Uh, I ran my motor a little bit too much. I apologize for that. But I wish you all the best. And uh, I admire what you're doing. I want you to keep doing it. Okay? All right? Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. I have, The participants thoroughly enjoyed the session. I mean, uh, we have on 90 minutes, I mean, almost 100 minutes of uh, talking that we had on the presentation and uh, time just flew. Uh, we, we couldn't, I mean, take a breath. There were so many queries, feedbacks, and thanks a lot for joining all the audience and spending some time over the weekend, sacrificing their, their personal or family lifetime and, and joining here. So once again, thank you, Ted. I hope we will we'll keep in touch. And uh, we will be requesting you for more and more informative and interactive session. So we tend to learn a lot on, on this managing the worry circle and the, the impact of the technology on social behavior. All righty. Thanks for some again. I appreciate what you're doing and what, what the organization is doing very, very much. Keep doing it. Be significant in the lives of others. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. 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 With this, our today's webinar is at the end of the day. You have all of those who have tuned in to your weekend, or to your family, or to your family, or to your family, you have given time here. So, thank you very much. We will be here with more informative webinars. We will be here with more informative webinars. We will be here with more feedback. We will be here with more feedback. We will be here with more Keep watching Agile. Uh, Pakistan Agile Development Society's Facebook page, LinkedIn page, or the YouTube channel. Jin logon ko ne ye program nahi dek sakhe ya nahi dek paaye unke liye ye recording available hogi. Apna aur apne ghar walon ka, apne ird gird ke logon ka khayal rakhiye. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Allah Hafiz.